Now, the rise of the novel in the Victorian era has a literary history of being marked with disenchantment, the sliding of religion into secularization, and post-secular studies work to combat that narrative. The post-secular framework wants to reconcile the religious with the secular, endeavoring to promote reading across established frameworks of knowledge to complicate the approach of each. In Lori Branch and Mark Knight's article, Why the Post-Secular post Matters, Literary Studies and the Rise of the Novel, they explain that post-secular studies look at modern manifestations of faith and secularism, secularism that previous paradigms had rendered invisible, and it is developing new vocabularies and frameworks for raising previously unasked questions about the complex connections between uh, religion and secularism and modernity. Branch and Knight want to resist the confined space that secular thought so often leaves for religion and examine theological texts and mind theoretical possibilities. Joshua Taft, in his article Disenchanted Religion and Secular Enchantment in a Christmas Carol, situates Dickens' novella in the Victorian age, marked again by the disenchantment that collapses religion into secularization. Now, he is responding throughout his argument to Max Weber's secularization theory. That says that the mysteries of the universe are now undone by science. Modern projects of secular enchantment, then, are the counters to Weber's argument being that they reanimate the universe with mystery. Taft argues that A Christmas Carol emerges as a surprisingly perceptive analysis of religion and secularism. It anticipates the central insights of secular secularization theory, the connections between faith, skepticism, and enchantment, while presenting religious possibilities that scholarship has only now begun to explore. For Taft, disenchanted religion is present in Carol thematically, while secular enchantment is found in its form. Religion is brought up in many disenchanted ways in the text whereby it is vague or reduced simply to ethics, but secular enchantment is represented in the carol's form. Taft asserts uh, of, the of the genres of the ghost story and the mask coupled with the description um, that points to the enchantment of the quotidian secular world. And Branch and Knight emphasize that their interest in the post-secular is not an attempt to replace one monolithic idea, the secular, with another, the religious, but rather to acknowledge and open up uh, the creative space for thinking that emerges when difficult ideas and disciplinary modes of thought are allowed to cross-pollinate. This is where Taft joins their project of the post-secular in his reading of Carol. Taft situates modernity as a complex moment when belief, skepticism, enchantment, and disenchantment all thrive, with two positions that orthodox secularization theory overlooks or dismisses, disenchanted religion and enchanted secularism. And one of the best portraits of religion in modernity can be found not in social theory, but in fiction. Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol, 1843, shows how these religious positions coexist, reminding us how each could appear compelling in turn. Now, Branch and Knight insist that there is relationship between religion and secular, positing them each as a type of knowledge that cannot derive its meaning in isolation because knowledge, like language, is relational, based in constructive interpretive acts of belief. Taft opens up the binary, presented in orthodox secularization theory of the novel, either providing evidence for enchanted religion or disenchanted secularism by cross-pollinating them and creating a relationship for the reversal he sees in Carol. Therefore, disenchanted religion and enchanted secularism are for Taft interpretive acts of belief that allow for the cross-pollination of each in Dickens's classic Christmas tale. Now, while Taft primes Carol for a post-secular study, he leaves it at that. 
he and I part ways primarily with his reading of the ghost's lack of agency and his assertion of the seeing is believing narrative that emphasizes the visualization of the text. I would like to challenge that the ghosts have significant agency in breaking through Scrooge's monologism with a dialogism that is the chance and the hope for his conversion into community. For Scrooge, the dialogical allows not just seeing, but being to be believing. In this paper, I will argue for a furthering of Taft's post-secular reading of the text, allowing the framework of the dialogic through a religious lens to interpret Scrooge's conversion. Now, Branch and Knight referenced 20th century discourse theorist Mikhail Bakhtin for his work on the dialogic in support of a post-secular post read of theirs from their seminar of Defoe's Robinson Corot. But get this, to suggest that the best sort of theological thought always proceeds in dialogue. Furthermore, reading back in through the lens of Christian thought, they say, reveals how the dialogic emphasis he saw in the emergence of the 18th and 19th century novel is rooted in the multi-voice narratives of the Judeo-Christian scriptures as much as it is in the plur plurality of modernity and can never be fully divorced from a religious sense of sacred or liturgical dialogue with the other as an act of faith. Therefore, Branch and Knight utilize Bakhtin's dialogical principle to support modern developments of the novel that allow for dialogue that interweaves the relationship of rather than parting out the religious from the secular. They are always already mixed. Now, political theorist Andrew Robinson in his article in Theory Bakhtin, Dialogism, Polyphony, and Heteroglossia helps the reader first understand Bakhtin's counterpoint of monologism. When, Roberts, when Robinson talks of Bakhtin's theory of dialogism, he explains monologism is taken to close down the world it represents by pretending to be the ultimate word, performing a kind of discursive death of the other, who as unheard and unrecognized is in a state of non-being. The monological word gravitates toward itself and its referential object. This emphatically describes Scrooge's condition. He puts humbug out into the universe to keep it from having any claim upon his participation. However, Robinson does point out uh, that Bakhtin's consideration of the world of the, mon um, of the monological is an overarching ideology instead of a person because he argues that it is integrated, integrated through a single consciousness and that consciousness is always a product of responsive interactions and cannot exist in isolation. If someone offers counter examples of hermits or psychological difference, it should be noted that such people are still in dialogue with their ecological surroundings, with nature, with multiple inner voices. There's no reason to assume dialogism stops at the limits of the interhuman. Nevertheless, language use can maximize this dialogical nature or seek to minimize or restrict it. So I will agree on this point and allow for the concession herein that Scrooge has successfully minimized, restricted the dialogic he is subject to at the beginning of the novel to his detriment. In many ways, Scrooge represents that overarching ideology, the law without mercy and forbearance, the institutions in place to keep the system running without interest or ability to hear, to talk about the needs and the wants of the other. Scrooge's monological existence keeps him from gifts of grace and being a gift himself. He is introduced in the text as hard and sharp as flint from which no still had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Scrooge is hardened towards anything outside of himself. His containment speaks to a protection he only trusts himself for. 
the narrator continues to develop how passers-by, beggars, children, and even flying dogs knew to steer clear of him. And that was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. His monological signals are clear to his would-be community, keeping him from any kind of exchange for the potential worse while disqualifying him from the potential better. The neighbors and his nephew cannot shift Scrooge from the monologue to the dialogue because he has fallen into unbelief. However, the supernatural breaks through and re-enchants Scrooge's ability to be in community and have a chance and hope of religious and ethical agency. So in Dickens' A Christmas Carol, the purpose for Marley's ghostly visitation is to warn Ebenezer that he has yet a chance and a hope of escaping Marley's fate, a chance and a hope of Marley's pro procuring. I argue that this chance and hope is the basis for a post-secular study of the text whereby the dialogical allows the possibility for Scrooge to gain spiritual and moral agency. Through close reading, I demonstrate how Scrooge's monological existence keeps him from gifts of grace and being a gift himself. The spirits he encounters bring him into the dialogical by engaging him in conversations he cannot avoid and showing him when he was in dialogue what his monological self costs now and the, and the inability for dialogue in the future. I want to close with one place of true religious debate that Taft finds in Carol and then give a concluding thought. So this place of religious debate is found in Scrooge's dialogue with the second spirit about the closing of bakeries and other establishments on Sunday. Taft uses this to cite that Dickens's broad church Christianity praises religion at its non-dogmatic best, and it attacks stringent forms of religion that interfere with human flourishing. Taft is picking up on the monologism of the Sunday bill. And again, this is a dialogic chance and a hope to work out why community matters. The spirit says to him, there are some upon this earth of yours who lay claim to know us and who do their deed of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name. Who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and change their doings on themselves, not us. This passage, along with a ghost quoting Scrooge back to himself about the question of whether there are no prisons or workhouses for the, ne the neglected children he shows them and the um, specters of ignorance and want. These passages have remarkable resonances to the final judgment in the New Testament where the exposed monologists will hear God say, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sorry, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Whew. As you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. I apologize. Um, the Sunday bill may have been said to have been used in God's name, but it acts out as a monological, as the monological that is counter to the spirit of communion found in the dialogical. Tuff says that Scrooge, free to act in the world again, is not quite as passive as he was while visited by spirits and has learned to value the world he inhabits rather than ignoring it in favor of his business. In this, he has said much. Scrooge is open now to the conversation, the dialogical, the exchange of community. The chance and a hope of the dialogical has come and he no longer needs to hide in monologism. Robinson explains that for Bactinians, the social world is also made up of multiple voices, perspectives and subjective worlds. To exist is to engage in dialogue and dialogue must not come to an end. Dialogue does not occur between fixed position or subjects. People are also transformed through dialogue. 
fusing with parts of the other's discourse. The other's response can change everything in one's own consciousness or perspective. Dialogue can produce a decisive reply, which produces actual changes.